Okay, so um, Jean-Francois has given a, a nice introduction to uh, the financing and the fundraising behind DNDI. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, <coughs> our model and uh, tell you about some of the innovations that we're applying, particularly in the open space, to try and help, um, particularly in early research. So um, just a reminder, DNDI is a not-for-profit virtual drug discovery organisation focused very much on patients' needs for the most neglected of diseases. Um, you can see the diseases for yourself here. Um, and what keeps us true to our purpose is having very clear, well-defined target product profiles that we publish on our website. This is good for keeping us on track, but I think it also helps us enormously with our partners and recruiting others to work in this field. There's a very clear goal that we're all agreed on, and um, it's really rooted in the needs of those patients. DNDI is 10 years old. It was 10 years old last year. Um, it's been I think pretty successful and just since 2007 it's managed to launch six new treatments and, and as Jean-Francois said it's this uh, changes in the, the, the impact on research, research for neglected tropical diseases uh, and using the investments that have been made well to give some more impacts like this is, is the key for us in the next 10 years. So DNDI has a reasonably busy portfolio, not least because we work across a panel of diseases. <clears throat> As you all know, drug discovery is a, a risky business, and although there's lots of, lots of compound names and, and numbers in the boxes here, many of them sadly are destined to fail. So it's really important for us to work hard to keep refueling the pipeline um, and to make sure that there are a future agents to go into the clinic. DNDI is obviously, like the other operators in this field, keen to share and use open data as much as we can. <clears throat> What does, what does this look like practically for us? Well, we publish like everyone else, so there's a, a, a ream of papers for fexanidazole, for example, um, talking about its repurposing discovery, its development, and now into the clinic. That's great, that's quite traditional, it's a very important part of what we do. We're also trying to deposit data earlier and a more comprehensive uh, deposition of data into databases <coughs> such as, um, as Kemble. So our screening data, and our optimization data, as much as possible, we'll put that into the open domain so that other people can use it. We benefit from lots of other um, <coughs> initiatives. We contribute to others. Um, one I'd pick out here is the pathogen box. Uh, we think this will be a really exciting step forward from MMV's um, uh, malaria box. I think that the initiative to spread this out to other pathogens is, is really important. Um, should foster a lot of basic research into targets, pathways, uh, repurposing and all sorts of other things that are going to help across a spectrum of diseases. So with DNDI is a keen supporter of this initiative as well. But I think it's fair to say that open innovation means a different thing to everybody on the planet, me included. I'm not an expert in the open source, open innovation um, definitions and criteria. For me, it, it, it comes back to something a little bit more, <clears throat> a bit more basic. I'm a bit more of a, a reductionist. Uh, science, for me, works through sharing and collaborating. Um, there's a continuum of more or less, more or less open approaches, um, but I think it boils down to three questions. <clears throat> What's shared? When's it shared? And with whom's it shared? You can wait five years for the Nature paper, um, but that's going to stifle the rapid follow-on and use of that information. Uh, you can put all your results in the open domain from the start but that obviously brings some challenges with it around IP and funding and publishing and everything else. So I'll let others worry about exactly what the title is and think more about <clears throat> what can we do to change the, the status quo and to tackle some of the issues that we face in, uh, in early research. And I'm not going to try and share everything straight away with everybody because it's probably not going to be useful anyway um, and it will kill me trying to do it. I'm going to focus on the things that I think will be most impactful and I'm going to tell you about some of the, the bottlenecks as we see them um, in the R&D pipeline, and particularly um, focusing in the research end where, where I operate. So what we characterise as research being high throughput screening, identify, um, identification of hits, going into the hit-to-lead process and the lead optimization process, such that we can present new preclinical candidates to go on further into development. So I've, I've just picked... Um, three areas that I want to, to pick up on. Um, <clears throat> we, we have quite a bit of data ourselves. There's quite a bit of published data. Um, and I think a good question is, do we always use that data as intelligently as we could? Do we see the whole picture when we're thinking about 
chemical series and their optimization. So do we, have we done everything we can to know our molecules? And given all that information, what, what more can computers do for us <coughs> in terms of building predictive activity models, help us, helping us to select further starting points and optimize the ones that we've, we've got? So using that data will be one theme. The main project I'm going to tell you about is the NTD Drug Discovery Booster. So following up on the question I asked before lunch, um, DNDI spends a lot of time working you know, very exciting and effective bilateral relationships with a number of pharmaceutical companies. Um, and this is a, an important pillar of what we're trying to do. But it does take us time, and quite a lot of those activities necessarily are partitioned. So we'd very much like to make that more of a collaborative environment in which we start to work with several companies together and share a little bit more information and resources. So I'll tell you some more about that. And then finally, once we get projects running in, in lead optimization, <clears throat> we spend, spend quite a lot of time and money and resources to do that medicinal chemistry optimization with all the partner disciplines that are required. And so we're looking at new ways to harness existing resources and to, to bring new resources into the neglected uh, arena. So our lead optimization Latin America project, LOLA, and um, some more open chemistry partnerships that we're, we're planning to, to bring forward will be the, the, the last part of the talk. So, moving on, um, drug discovery, um, particularly for kinetoplastids, so the, the parasites that cause HAT, Chagas, and, and Leishmaniasis, um, are tricky things to find hits for, <clears throat> um, particularly for the intracellular parasites that cause Le Leishmaniasis and Chagas disease, the hit rates are exquisitely low, less than 0.01% in, in primary high throughput screening. So, although the the throughput's increased in recent years with industrialization and the efforts of organizations such as GSK. Um, <clears throat> we still don't have enough hits to really be confident that we're going to deliver the uh, multiple candidates that we need if we're going to go through and deliver more than one NCE to give us combinations of oral drugs for the patients. So it's really important for us to do more to find more hits, but when we get a hit, we've got to do everything we can to make the most of it, make sure we pick the right hits and we move them forward quickly. And this comes to my, my first point. So we've got some data, there's some published data, um, and we want to make sure that we've captured this and we're using it as, as well as we can so that when we, when we start to make important investment decisions about uh, chemistry and starting projects, we're doing it in the right place, we're addressing the right issues, and we're moving as quickly as we can. And given these precious hits, can we use them to find others? So can we, can we build computational models? Can we go and look in commercial collections or in pharmaceutical companies' collections? in a more guided way rather than high throughput random screening which takes a lot of time and costs a lot of resources. So the first of these is um, <clears throat> recognizing that DNDI screened um, 15 or 20 or with 15 or 20 organizations multiple times many compound collections um, and we've reviewed these on an individual basis <clears throat> but to take a step back and look at all of that data uh, and look at all the data that's in the public domain, in databases um, such as Kemble, um, <coughs> so that we can really annotate those compounds as individuals and as series and cluster them together, has allowed us to develop a workflow where we've um, gone through and reanalyzed all of these hits, reviewed them and identified some series that were previously unknown to us, perhaps because they were made up of singletons from different screening campaigns. We've then been able to go on and apply uh, searches to public databases, commercial compounds, <coughs> purchase these and test them to see if, if we can expand the SAR. Um, and we'll be able to go further by sharing these, these um, models um, with, with our pharmaceutical partners as well. But all of this work is, is only as good as the data that we have. <coughs> so the more data people publish and deposit or give us access to, whether it's in an open sense or whether it's in a shared confidential basis, the better we'll be, we'll be able to do this job. <coughs> Um, and just to think about predictive activity models, we're looking for needles in haystacks, and if we're going to do something better than sticking our head in a haystack and ferreting around for ages, it would be much better if we could be a bit more guided, could we use a magnet to pull the needle out of the haystack a bit quicker. So again, this is building those models, um, uh, two- and three-dimensional models in computers, so based on fingerprints, based on three-dimensional structures. Um, <clears throat> we've then made predictions of activity for, of compounds in commercial libraries. We've purchased those and we're in the process of screening them. We're optimistic that this will give us some new starting points. 
and that given the validation of these models to then use them um, with our pharmaceutical partners in their really large and, and interesting diverse collections of compounds will help us find some more of those precious needles in the haystacks. The data sources that we've used for this activity have come from some companies, so AbbVie, GSK, um, some organisations such as uh, the Dundee Drug Discovery Unit, uh, from Institute Pasteur and Career, and from published collections. But it's still only a fraction of what we know has been generated, and so it's still a major goal for us to try and access more of this to encourage people to publish it and share it, um, because the more, the data, more data we have, the better the results will be. However, I think the conclusion from this is that even a bit of the data that we, um, and, and publishing more of the data um, can be very enabling and allow us to do some really valuable activities and discovery. So um, same challenge, different approach. So what else can we do to make really good use of the hits that we have from, from high throughput screening? And this is where the, the, the neglected tropical disease drug discovery booster concept comes from. So that the aim is to expand the hits that we get from screening quickly to enable us to find related series that are perhaps a slightly different scaffold, um, and also to annotate those series, so get information from different partners that have worked on those series and help us to make better decisions and, and to guide the, the forward programme better. And overall, the intention is that this will make it faster and reduce the cost of discovering new um, clinical candidates. So what does this look like um, for the chemist in the room? Um, we might find a, a chemical structure from a high throughput screen Probably for some of the difficult parasites, we might have to screen tens or hundreds of thousands of compounds to find one series that we think is really valuable. So we want to make the most of this, this seed. Traditionally, chemists would go into the lab and make lots of analogues, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, each of those analogues could have a, a subtle modification in the structure, and that helps us to understand the relationship between structure and activities. However, there's a good chance that a lot of those compounds have been made somewhere else on the planet before and we know that the pharma industry has millions of compounds um, and within those millions of compounds probably some of these analogues and so we'd really like to work with the partners that have the different pieces of the picture um, the, of the puzzle to put it together with us so rather than having to work make all the compounds afresh or just working with one organization that's perhaps got a few analogues we'd like to work across the industry or at least with a significant portion of it to build the picture more quickly and more efficiently the analogy again, we want to look in multiple haystacks. We don't want to do it one at a time. We want to do it all together with a really big magnet and to try and pull out the best hits um, and the best annotations that we can right up, right up front. So just to try and summarise that, the, the, the goal is faster, cheaper drug discovery and that rapid expansion of, of a new hit. Um, crucially, we'd gain a lot of information and develop SAR before we have to commit to new chemistry. Chemistry takes time, takes resources, it costs, costs us a lot of money. So if we can use existing information, existing compounds, it's much better. And ultimately, many of these series would have been worked on as part of programs with inside companies. Um, and the, expand, the information they can give us about those series um, may be overlapping, it may be different, but it will all be valuable and it will really help us to move those projects forward uh, well, to select the best projects and then to move them forward with the most information and the best guidance possible. So those annotations um, uh, uh, tell us about the good things, but they also highlight the risks for us as well. So if there's a series that's just too risky, we won't start. And if there's a critical risk, we can address it early. So the annotations are a really valuable piece. And the, the advice and the guidance from the pharmaceutical partners that have, have worked on these series will be invaluable. So without diving into too much detail, what does the NTD booster look like? So here's quite a complicated diagram, but we would aim to start on the left-hand side with a single compound, as I showed you a couple of uh, slides ago. This would be the seed for growing the, the series. We'll show this structure to a number of companies. I've shown four here. I hope it'll be more. And that each of these companies will then go and use computers to search their uh, corporate collections and, and pick out 100 most similar compounds to our original hit from their one, two, three million compounds that they may have in their collections. DNDI will then screen them. Uh, this will all be blinded to, to, DN, uh, to the other members of the consortium, but we'll see, we hope, better compounds coming out of this, this screening process. And the very best compound that comes out of that iteration across the whole uh, consortium will provide the hit for the next iteration. And we'll run this process in cycles. We'll iterate it perhaps two or three times to, to really mine out the best of the compounds as much of the SAR as we can. We hope this will give us a better series with more, more examples, 
And crucially, at this stage, we'll really be asking for as much annotation as we can from the partners. So we'll have a, a series where we've got lots of information, um, extended SAR, and a, and a good idea as to whether this is a series we can take forward. And if it is, what should we be addressing? And maybe um, how to address those issues. So overall, we hope this would reduce the, um, the time for HIT to lead, which is a signif significant portion of our current research process, from perhaps 12 to 18 months down to three, three to four or six months. And that because we'd be starting in a stronger position in lead optimization, we might halve the time it takes us to do lead optimization. This is a difficult, resource intensive and expensive stage of the process, so this will be a major cost saving. Um, it might take us four to five years and five to six million euros for, for the sake of a starting point to complete the research phase, to go th from screening hits through hit to lead and lead optimization. We hope that the, the, the booster will significantly reduce the hit to lead uh, component of this process in terms of time and also speed up the lead optimization process. And so this critical work with a, um, across the private sector, we hope will really reduce the time and also the cost to do this early research phase. And let's face it, doing early research is the most difficult piece to raise funding for because we're furthest away from the patient. So this is really important for us to manage our own shop and try and speed up and reduce costs. Furthermore, um, we're going to work more with, uh, to speed up the lead optimization process. This is where we're starting to do a lot of chemistry. There's a huge capacity for doing synthetic and medicinal chemistry um, within Europe and across the globe. Only a small portion of it is applied to NTD research at the moment, and we're very keen to work in a more open way to engage, particularly some more of the public sector and some more universities, um, to help us move those chemical series forward once we've identified some good starting points. And we're hoping that this will um, further drive the costs down, and I think critically incre increase the sustainability of the process. So to keep having to go back to funders to raise money for early research becomes increasingly challenging. If we can build a more sustainable model where we're really engaged with the, um, the academic world as well as the public, as, as well as the private sector, I think we'll have a more sustainable model for future drug discovery. So this is kind of a picture of where we want to go. There's a couple of other things I've mentioned in my talk, the pathogen box, which we hope is going to um, give us more choices for screening and better choices for the hits that we start on and tell us about the targets and pathways that we screen in. So DNDI is a keen supporter of this, which is clearly a, at the very open end of innovation. Um, and I mentioned briefly our lead op Latin America um, <clears throat> consortium. So again, this is a way to try and move forward series and chemistry. Moving into an area uh, in Brazil where there's an enormous uh, scientific cap um, capability and capacity, huge will to work on diseases that are endemic um, in Brazil and, and Latin America. Um, and with some um, you know, extra input from DNDI and our partners, we hope to really um, harness some of those resources again, in an open way to help us move these, these projects forward to discovery of new clinical candidates. So I hope that gives you a, a snapshot of where we see some of the pinch points in early research and what we're trying to do to try and address some of them, um, particularly with more or less open projects, but certainly with science and with, with collaborative approaches. So I haven't got a slide with all the partners that we're working on because there are so many, but thanks to all of them, to the donors, uh, the scientific partners, public and private, uh, all the institutions that we work with, and to you for your attention.